Let's take a look at how to make this construction style motion graphics animation in After Effects. Tip -tot. This series was recorded during the coronavirus scare and due to spacing issues in the house, we'll have no webcam. Sorry about that, but hopefully you can still learn something from this tutorial series. Hello everybody and welcome back to Tipta and welcome to another motion graphics tutorial. I received an email the other day from School of Motion. Uh, I was looking into their Illustrator course and attached to the email was this neat little motion graphic here where these boxes were drawn on as if somebody was creating them in Illustrator. And I thought, hey, that looks pretty cool. I wonder if I can do that. And I created this one, which is, as you can see, along the same style, but completely new um, and a little bit longer, more smoother. They like their snappy animations. I prefer these more kind of fluid ones. So I thought, why not show you guys how I put this together? The first step was to create a file in Illustrator with all of the separate layers. Um, I'll pop a little time lapse up of how I did that on the screen now. But essentially, I'm not going to take you through this. It's a case of drawing some shapes, you know, picking a color and that's all there is to it. You just pop some boxes on top of each other. You grab your triangle, you know, or something like that, your polygon tool and you pop a triangle on top of some boxes. Seems pretty simple, right? One thing I will take you through, however, is what I did to get this ready for After Effects. Essentially, when you're importing from Illustrator to After Effects, you need to make sure that every animatable element that you want to change is on a separate layer. So as you can see here, I have the floor, the background, the base, the green, the light green part of the box, the dark green part of the box, the shadow of that box, um, all and the transform elements all on different layers. Okay, so I can choose, pick and choose all of these elements separately. What this will do is when we import this into After Effects, it will give us an animatable element for each of them. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm just gonna save this file. So we've got everything in the place that we need. I'm gonna go over to my After Effects file. As you can see, we have the old version here with a triangle top. I'm gonna to do the same thing, but I thought I'd do it with a round top shape instead this time around. And you'll also notice that I've got transform boxes, fake transform boxes for every shape, and that's important as well. So once you've made your Illustrator file, however you want that to be, you need to import your work into After Effects. I like to hit Control I and import my um, Illustrator file here, MoGraph Construction Tutorial 2. Please ignore Windows 10's horrible dark mode. You just need to make sure that Create Composition is on and Import as Footage, that's fine. Click Import, that'll create a composition up here. You want to choose uh, composition, retain layer size. Yeah, okay. Now that's going to make for you a um, uh, a what? <laughs> a composition. Wow, I had a complete blank there. Sorry about that. Uh, it's because there's two. Why, why has there been two made? I don't know. Anyway, let's delete this one. All we need is this one here. So we have our composition. Inside that composition is a layer for each of the layers that we had in Illustrator. You'll see that even though this sort of transform tool is made up of several elements, it's treated as one element inside After Effects, and that's because it only takes actual layers, not groups. Yeah, this is an editable group with all different parts in it, but Illustrator, uh, sorry, After Effects doesn't care about that. After Effects only cares about um, layers. So once we have our layers separated, the first thing I did was to take any elements that I knew I wasn't going to animate and remove their color. I'm going to choose the base and make that gray as well. And then I went through and I took everything that should have been green and I made the preview of that green. Take everything that should have been yellow and made it yellow. And this is just so that at a, a glance we can see what's going on in our composition. Uh, we need purple, the purple bit. And for the cursor, I did it in black, which is none. So as you can see, all of our elements now at a glance, we can easily see what correlates to what shape. Now, first thing I, I did was to animate our cursor. Um, so I went through and I selected all of our layers and I turned continuously rasterize on. And this means that when I skew and scale and squash and stretch them, they're not going to become pixelated. Let's zoom into our cursor here uh, and grab our pan behind tool and make sure that the snapping option is on in the top left. And I'm just going to drag the anchor point up to the top left here so that I can rotate and scale this based on that top left positional point. 
Uh, and then to me, that cursor looks a little bit too small actually. So I'm just going to increase it to about 130%. That looks a bit better. Now we need to choose the path that this cursor is going to take. And we're going to use that to dictate obviously the movements of the rest of the animation. So I want this to start down here on the bottom left and it's important or it's helpful rather to leave snapping on because it's going to snap then to the edges of all your blocks and you'll know that your movements are going to be nice and smooth. I'm going to grab position keyframes by hitting P on our cursor layer and I'm just going to keyframe there. Let's move over 10 frames with control shift and the right arrow and then I'm just going to drag up this shape to something that's a little bit above and a little bit to the left of this right hand corner. Now, if we dragged it over to this corner exactly, our shape growing is going to be pretty boring. We want to get that nice bounciness that you can see in the original one here. It kind of comes up stretch and it bounces back before coming down. OK, so to achieve that, we're just going to drag it off slightly. That's going to create a new keyframe. Then I had it rest for four frames. So control and right one, two, three, four. Let's add in a new keyframe and we will then go 10 frames over, uh, sorry, uh, go 10 frames over after we've set this keyframe. So that's going to take four frames to move down to the bottom left here. My mistake. Then go 10 frames over and move it over to the right hand side here. Now I want this to be in line with the top of the green box. So I'm just going to line it up and then holding shift, I'm going to drag it over to there. One, two, three, four. And I'm just going to hide these other shapes for now and then move it over to the corner of our shape here, like so. Let's move another 10 frames. Again, I want this to be on the top of our shape. So I'll drag it to there and then move it over a little bit. So as you can see, I'm overshooting quite a bit each time. Move that four frames. So now we've drawn the ball. It moves down, we've drawn the green box, it moves over, we've drawn the yellow box. It now needs to move over to the center of this shape here and move 10 frames and just drag that up. And this one I'm going to drag way up, like up to here. And as you can see, each direction of your shape should follow the direction on this box. So I've actually done that wrong. Uh, I did it the other way around accidentally. You can see that on our green box here, it moves from the bottom right to the top left when it should be moving the other direction. And that's just my mistake. I just did that in the wrong corners. So I'm just going to move these over. And it's going to end up over here. So I'm going to take four frames to get to that position. And this one is again incorrect. It's just my mistake. Drawing the boxes the other way. That's going to have to get positioned over here. And then this one is fine. So now we've got the shapes following the right places. This one's going to have to start from the bottom of the box. And let's have it just go straight up, actually. Something like that. OK, now we can make sure that it's exactly correct by copying this X value and pasting it here like so. And now we've got the blocked movements of our cursor. OK. Let's have him rest for four frames, stay in the same position, and then take 20 frames, so twice the amount of time, to just move off to the side. So we've got a bit of time for everything to settle. Now, let's add a nice bit of easing to these keyframes. So at the moment, all of these keyframes are linear, which doesn't look very good, as you can tell. We want to add some movement to these. I'm just going to select them all and hit F9, which is going to easy ease every single keyframe that we've got here. What that does, if we look at our grid view, makes it just a little bit smoother. Boom, 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 boom. Now, still a bit crazy, but don't worry, because once you've drawn these boxes in, it becomes a little bit easier to follow, as you can see here. You're not really following the mouse movements, you're following the shape movements. But the mouse movements dictate the shape movements, which is why we're doing the mouse first. So I'm taking my smooth curves here, and I'm just going to select the end point of each of the major 10 frame ones. And I'm just going to make it go faster slow by dragging out the right handle. OK. I'm going to leave this one, I think, for now. Be more of a casual movement. Boop, 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 boop. That's good. Boom. 
moves down, drags out that shape, moves over, drags out that shape, moves over, drags out that shape, settles. Good. The only thing I don't like about this is that the um, last movement here is a straight line. I want it to have a little bit of a curve to it. Just so that this path is dif differentiated from the straight paths of drawing the shapes. So I'm going to select my endpoint with the pen tool. I'm just going to grab this little handle and we're going to curve. Maybe we curve upwards instead of downwards. And that's just going to adjust the path that that cursor takes. And that final part there. Brilliant. Okay, now we can move on to the fun bit. And we'll do the rest of this um, path where the mouse comes back and deletes the other elements. Here, we'll do that at the end. Okay, so element one, we need to animate this ball. Now it's important that um, you collect, correctly connect all of your layers together. For example, I'm going to take everything from my purple ball here, which is more blue actually. Um, maybe to confuse myself, I'll make that blue. Yeah, that's a bit better. I know it says purple still, but that's fine. We're going to connect purple dark to purple light with the Pickwhip tool. And we're going to connect purple transform to purple light with the pick whip tool. Then when we scale and squash and stretch purple light, it affects everything. Now, obviously, we want this to grow from this center middle point where the mouse is um, currently connected. So I'm going to grab my pan behind tool with snapping on. And I'm just going to drag this down to that central middle point, which means when we scale and stretch things, it's going to do so from that area there. Let's hit S to bring up our scale keyframes, and I'm just going to uncheck the constrained proportions so that we can edit these individually. I'm going to click the stopwatch to keyframe scale. And I'm just going to make sure that I've got keyframes in every position for now, and we're going to follow the movements of these. Now, this is only four. One, two, three, four. I want to have consistent motion throughout my project in either increments of 10 or 5, and that creates a nice rhythm. So instead of having these be four keyframes between motions, I'm going to have them be five by just shifting them and moving them all along. And this will be important later. So this first keyframe for the shape of the ball is going to go from um, naught naught all the way up to larger than 100 on its Y axis at least because it's going to be stretched. Now the good thing about importing it from Illustrator makes a layer with 100% is its normal shape. So you don't need to worry about remembering um, size or position um, figures here. We can safely go down to zero, zero on this first keyframe. And then we can safely squash and stretch this one until we get something that we think looks a little bit more realistic. Probably something like that. When that releases, I want this to snap down, which is why we've only gone five frames here. We can have it really squish. And then with another 10 frame gap, control shift right, I'm going to have it squash and stretch up just a little bit more. So it's slightly taller than it is wide. So probably something like 105, 95 down there. And then another 10 frames, we're going to have it come back to its regular scale. OK, so we've got it stretch and then sploosh. Now, the reason I did all of this easing is because it's super simple to follow this easing now with the rest of our shapes. So if I hit F9, and I'm just going to select the keyframes for this cursor and the keyframes for this ball just for now so I can show you the difference. The purple is um, the keyframes for the cursor. OK, and as you can see, the keyframes for the scale of the ball are red and green in both directions. I'm going to select both of them. And if I just drag them out one at a time to 100 percent influence, they're all going to have the same growth rate as that cursor. So you can see now the cursor looks like it's dragging that ball up. OK, so that's going to go fast or slow. And then because it's moved so fast there and slowed down, when the cursor lets go, we want it to sort of gradually snap into that lower position. It looks all right at the moment. OK, but it doesn't look super great. Now I want to make an inverted W shape with these keyframes. So I'm going to grab all of these ones here, uh, being careful, of course, not to grab the cursor one, because I just want to affect the purple light scale keyframes. So in fact, now that I've illustrated the point with that cursor, I'm just going to select the scales. I'm going to grab both of these and I'm just going to push this out the other way. Now just watch the ball. Immediately that looks boom. much more natural. Boom. Yeah. Boom. Now I'd like this one to go a little bit faster. 
like so. And I'd like this one to just have a tiny bit of influence on the other way. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Boom. Now, a few extra elements then. We obviously want the transform tool, the transform um, graphics to fade away once we, the mouse lets go of the ball. So we'll do that. Okay. Once it drags up like so, and the mouse is going to start to move, I'm going to take my purple transform layer. I'm going to hit T to bring up the opacity, and I'm going to keyframe it. I'm going to move five frames. And as you can see, that's aligned with the rest of it. So it's going to create a nice rhythm. Change that opacity to zero. Simple as that. Nice. One more thing, though, however, that I like is that it makes sense to me that if I was pulling up on this and as it snapped down, the cursor kind of moves to the right a little bit. And I like to think that it's maybe not actually let go until about there. And that would push the ball along the table. So I'm going to grab my purple light layer, grab my position keyframe with shift P to bring it up as well as the scale. And as soon as it lets go, I'm just going to hit my position keyframe and I'm going to roll it all the way along. Let's go 10 frames longer than when the squishing and scaling stops. I'm just going to shift that over a little bit. Okay. In fact, what I might do is push it just a little bit further. Because I quite like that. Oof, there we go. Let's hit F9 on just that last keyframe, which is going to bring it to a nice slow stop. And take a look. Boom. Nice. That looks pretty good. Let's select these keyframes and I'm just going to push that slowness over a little bit. Let's see what 100% looks like. That's a bit too much. So let's go to something like 50% influence. Good. That's just going to bring it to a nice smoother stop there. And the ball is done. Boom. There we go. So what I like to do for now is I'm going to trim these layers and then hide them. OK, so I know for a fact that the ball comes in from the start. That's fine. But once the purple transforms fade away, I don't need them anymore. So I can just hit Alt, close square bracket to cut off my layer there. Just means it's easy to look at. The other two layers I do need for a while, though. So I'm just going to select all these and press U to collapse them. And I know that I'm finished with this ball for now. What I can do to make my life easier is just hide that for now because we're finished with that bit of the animation. So let's move on and do the rest of the shapes. The rest of these shapes have a little bit more going on because um, the ball, the shadow on the ball and on this top pink shape as well, are going to be coming in at the same time. But the shadows on these other boxes are going to be coming in at different times because the boxes are going to kind of rotate into place. And then when the new box is drawn on top, this other shadow is going to drop down too. So let's go to frame 15 where the start of this box begins and let's do everything the same we've just done for the green box. I can hit Alt open square bracket because I know this is the point where my green box is going to start. I'm going to connect green dark to green light and green shadow to green light as well. I'm also going to move the pan behind tool to the bottom left of green dark. We're going to choose scale. We're going to keyframe it and unlock it like we did before and we'll move over 10 frames and we'll just position it with the transform tool, selection tool over to here. Oops, excuse me. I forgot to link green transform to that too. So we'll grab this and we'll squash and stretch that out to here. In fact, we'll just make sure that we only stretch X for this one, because otherwise we're going to get some weird effects. When we draw the yellow box, there'll be a little bit of a gap, which won't look good. So we're only going to stretch X. Uh, then there's going to be five frames, one, two, three, four, five. And you can see how this guide movement here is going to influence and help us with the guide keyframes for the rest of this. We'll keyframe it back to there. It's going to have to snap back really thin, I think. Go over 10 frames, it can expand a little bit more further than it should. And then it should go back to 100. Nice. Let's add our easing onto that. F9, go to our graph here and do the usual, which is to um, fast to slow on this first one, slow to fast with 100% influence on this second one. Boom, see, bam, bam. Now that's not quite lined up. Let's see why. I don't think this one has 100% influence. Let's check.
Uh, I think it's not connecting because that final point is actually a little bit off where I've only adjusted the X position. So if I just temporarily change that to snap to that point, there we go. That should now, thump, thump. that looks nice. So when I then shrink this down to zero, zero on the first frame, that should link up perfectly. Uh, oh, no, sorry, it doesn't now because I need to tweak the Y because I haven't changed the Y and then it will link up perfectly. There we go. Get your easing right. So now that we do have our easing, let's take all of this, stretch it that way a little bit. And just a tiny touch that way. Okay. Boom. That looks good. Boom. In fact, I think what I might do for this one is just easy ease these frames so that we've got just snappy motion on those first two and they settle back a bit better here. Yeah, that looks nice. Okay, so let's take our green dark layer now. And as our box gets stretched here, we want our green dark layer to start arriving. So I'm going to grab my green uh, dark. I'm going to add a set mat to that. I'm going to effects and presets, waiting for it to load and choosing set mat from the options menu. Drag that down to the layer green dark. And I'm going to choose the set mat to be green light, which means that this layer only appears when it overlapping content on the green light layer, meaning if I move this off, it's going to mask out that content. So we are going to change the alignment options here to be like so. And you'll notice that this scales with our box. OK, so if we were to animate this coming on later, it's still going to squash and stretch with that, but different uh, parameters and therefore it's going to look a bit nicer. So let's take our position keyframe here, move over 10 frames, and we can align those two shapes together. Oops. Now, the way I do this is I hide my green transform, and I take my green dark layer, and I just shift it over until the pixels line up like that. OK, and you'll notice it'll be in zero, zero, because that was its original position. And this one, um, because we changed it, is not so. So that's zero aligned left with the layer below it. OK, so we'll take a look at this. We'll hit F9 on these frames here. And we'll make them go fast or slow. Bing. Let's see what that looks like. I think it needs to be five frames. Stretch, bam, snap. Maybe not actually, that's quite slow. Let's have it be back to 10 frames, but have it jump in here. Boom. That might be nice. Boom. Or maybe it should start coming in at the beginning. Mm. Or halfway through. That looks pretty good. Let's see how I did it on the first one. The shape goes grown. Oh, well, first of all, I did it coming the other way. And then I had it appear. Yeah, five frames. Boom. And then I had it back off a bit as well. So let's do that then. Let's have it be five frames. But then we'll have it come um, out a little bit more and back a little bit more, like so. Why does this one look better? Ah, it's because the shadow is on an opposite side this time. So what we'll do is we'll just have it come out like this. Boom. 
We'll have it take 10 frames. Like that. Or maybe what we'll do actually is instead of animating its position, we'll animate its scale. Sorry, just having a bit of a play here rather than just doing the same thing twice. We're going to take that down to zero. We'll move over five frames and we'll have it come out further than it should. 10 frames, we'll have it go back a bit. And then here we'll have it settle. Hit F9 on those. This should have to snap into position that way. Boom. Yeah, that looks better. Nice. Turn the ball back on to see what it looks like in its entirety, because obviously it's going to be hidden. Yeah, that looks quite nice. I think one thing it needs, though, is a bit more settling. So both of these need more time to jiggle into place. It's going to stretch. It's going to shoot under. This time we'll make it go um, over just a little bit. So this one is reducing. Boom. We'll just reduce that to just below 100, which is obviously going to affect the shape above it. This one we'll put to just above 100. And this time we'll put this to above, just below 100. And then that should, if all the easing is still there, yep, make it settle just a bit longer. Yeah, that looks a bit nicer. Cool. Let's see what that looks like on five frames rather than 10. Is there any small movements? Nah, that looks bad. We'll stick with 10. Cool. Bling. Maybe that's too many still. Yeah, that looks good. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. Let's take green transform box, drop its opacity down from 100 to zero over those five frames. Yeah, that looks nice. Okay, last one then is we need to, I know you can't really see it, but you will um, by the end. In fact, let's move this ball over so that we can see it more. Um, if I just take these position keyframes and just go one, two, three, four, five, like that. And then this mouse here will take both of these and we'll go one, two, three, four, five. So they still align. That just gives us a bit more of that shadow visible. Okay. We need to make sure that this ends up back at 100. So that it aligns with that shadow. And now during the 10 frames that this cursor is meant to be drawing the shape above, which is these 10 frames here. Okay. We want this shadow to move down because that shape being drawn above it is going to cast this shadow. So we'll take green shadow here. We'll add a set mat to that as well, which we will again set to be green light. And we'll take the position of that 10 frames. And on the first one, we'll just shift that all the way up so you can't see it. Like so. We'll hit F9. And we will go from fast to slow because that's how this above shape is going to be drawn. So we'll take these two keyframes and we'll go fast to slow. So that's going to come down as that box there is being drawn. Yeah. Boom. Boom. That's good. Okay. So let's take this box now. We know this layer can end. We know all these layers are going to start here and we'll do the same thing and we can speed through this now because it's literally the same thing. So we're going to pin yellow dark to yellow light. We're going to pin yellow shadow to yellow light. We're going to pin yellow transform to yellow light. We're going to take the scale of yellow light and unconstrain it. Add in a keyframe, move 10 frames, move five frames, 
move 10 frames. And then another 10 frames to settle into position. This one here starts at zero and zero. This one here, uh, we need to make sure that we have set the pan behind to be down in the bottom left. This frame here is gonna stretch out to meet this shape. It's then gonna sploosh back down. It's gonna come back at slightly more than 100. And then it's gonna settle again. We'll keyframe all of those. And we'll do the usual fast to slow, and then slow to fast. And then we'll leave these just settling like normal. Yeah, that looks good. Boom. We can take the scale of the yellow dark, which we will pin or anchor to this side here. Take the scale of that. First of all, we'll make sure to do a set mat on it. Alpha channel should be yellow light. Take the scale of that, make it 0, 100. Um, what do we do here? We did 5, 10, 10, so it follows it. That's going to go above 100 a little bit. Then it's going to go back down to below 100 a little bit. And it's only going to settle at 100. We'll F9 all of those. Go fast to slow. And then leave them to settle. Looks pretty good. As it's drawing the shape above it, the pink shape, um, we will have this shadow slide down from the bottom. Uh, slide down from the top, sorry. So again, we'll set that to be yellow light as the set map. We'll set the start point with Alt open square bracket. And we'll just position keyframe over 10 frames. The shadow. We'll set the anchor point of that shadow to be the top middle. And we will pull this up and off. And then it's because I changed that anchor point, it's coming to the middle here. But don't worry, because we've got snapping on, we can just position that naturally up here. Like so, if you want to see and check that that's gone correct, you can just turn off that pink layer. But because we've got the set mapped um, applied, it doesn't matter anyway if you go over a little bit because it's going to be hidden. So we'll grab both these keyframes, hit F9. It's going to go fast or slow because that's how the shape is drawn above it. Boom, looks good. So let's watch the whole thing. Looks nice, okay. I think this shape here I don't like because it's growing way too much. Because it's like 116. Whereas even on its fullest one here, it only went up to 127. So I'm going to just put that down to like 106. And then here it's gone way too small. It should be on 100. There you go. That's why that was looking so crazy to me. Yeah, that's much nicer. Okay. Doop, doop, doop. Looking nice. Okay. Final one then, let's take yellow transform. And once it's been drawn, we need some keyframes to knock it out of existence. Just make sure that aligns up correctly. So it's gonna fade. Boom. Okay, and then the last shape is the pink one. Now the pink one's slightly different process because again, the shadow's already here and we really wanna like emphasize its crazy um, growth. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to take pink light, which this time is above pink dark. So this, in this case, the pink dark is our lowest layer. Yeah. So we need to make sure that that's the one it's all linked to. So we'll take pink light and we'll take pink transform and pin them both to pink dark. We'll take the scale of pink dark, and unlink it, and we'll go to zero. Then we'll keyframe that scale, move over 10 frames, and start scaling up the Y. Oops, excuse me. We did not pin the um, anchor point to the bottom middle, which is the first step. I'm a foolish boy. There we go. Let's fix that. 
So we'll take the scale of both of this and turn it down to zero, zero. Keyframe it, move over 10 frames, push the Y point up to the maximum, and we'll just want the X to be just a little bit here. Okay, now I'm going to align this like so, and then move over five frames. I'm really squashing and stretch this one out. Boom. Okay, move over 10 frames. Squash and stretch it about 10. And then another 10 frames and we'll bring it back to 100. Okay, same process for this moment. But then we want the whole thing to shake because of the emphasis that this pink block has had on the other two blocks. So once we've done this section, which is the same, up, bloomf, yeah, which I think looks the best. Again, as we draw this, zoom. Now, the shadow here on this yellow box is actually coming in a little bit early for my liking. I probably want it to come in as it starts to go like that, because otherwise this here wouldn't be casting a shadow here because it's not wide enough. So on this occasion, I'm actually going to take the um, uh, shadow of the yellow box down here. I'm just going to push it over just a little bit. Maybe to the start point of this. That to me looks more natural. Boom. Yeah, nice. Maybe it can be five frames even. Yeah, that looks good. Okay. So then we have our mouse moving away. So that's fine. We've now done all the blocks coming on. Okay, so you can see how that looks all right. Let's quickly take pink transform and the opacity of it and knock it down over those five frame period, the same as before. But you'll notice the other one had a lot more impact than this. Okay, and that's because once the pink triangle was finished being drawn, it pushed everything else. Yeah, and this is a really cool thing that you can do quite easily, actually. All we need to do is create a null object that joins all of our layers. Uh, I'm just collapsing all of these now, so it's a bit easier to see. Create a null object that joins all of our layers and scales them based on the bottom position of our pink frame. Now, if that doesn't make sense to you, don't worry, it will in a second. First thing you need to do is go Control Shift Alt Y, which creates a new null object, or you can just do layer new null. OK, and that creates this little red square in the center, which doesn't look like anything, but it's just essentially a control thing that we can use to control our other elements. We're going to take our pan behind tool and we're going to grab this and pop it at the bottom middle anchor point. And then we'll move our null object down to the center middle of our green block. Now this next step is not necessary, but I like to do it. I like to scale my null so that it covers the shapes that I want it to scale. Something like this, yeah? And if you want to, you can reposition it so you get an exact scale. You don't need to do this. But what it means is if we start squashing and stretching this whilst it's still a small square and it's affecting everything else, it's gonna affect things exponentially. We're gonna move this square a little bit and it's gonna scale these blocks a lot. Whereas if you match it roughly to what you want to scale, then it's gonna scale it on almost a one-to-one -one ratio. So the amount you scale it here will be roughly the amount the blocks actually scale. So we're gonna call this uh, pink pin because it's the shape that the pink um, block dropping is going to affect. Then we want to pin all of the blocks in this stack, not the ball, but all the blocks in this stack to that null object. So we're going to take pink dark. We don't need to do pink light or pink transform because they are pinned to pink dark. So we'll take pink dark and pin it to pink pin. We'll take yellow light and we'll pin that to pink pin. And we'll take green light and we'll pin that to pink pin. Now, when I affect pink pin, it affects everything. OK, now you can see in the previous one here, I've got the same thing, pink pin. And if I bring up the keyframes for that, you can see that it just follows the pink shape. As the pink shape gets dropped, so let's bring up triangle pink keyframes, OK? Just before that pink shape there finishes its downward movement, that's when the downward movement of this uh, null object starts, because it's going to be influenced by the snapping down of that pink object. Boff, yeah? Like a little delayed. Thunk. And all it does is just scale down, scale up, scale down, scale up, like we did before. But this time it's affecting every other object. So we're going to go to scale keyframes. We're going to unlock those. We're going to keyframe it. Move over five keyframes. 
Now, this time I'm going to just lay them all out because this is not obviously 100 to 100 anymore because we squashed and stretched it early. So I am just going to come in and I like this one to be rather jelly-ish. So I'm going to add one more than I did to the others. Just give it a bit of settling time. I'm going to move to the frame before the last frame of our squash to give it a bit of impact. And then we're going to squash and stretch everything. And we're going to make this really bloomf, quite powerful. OK. So now we just need to go to this one, squash it up a little bit, take it to this one, squash it down just a touch, take it to this one, squash it up just a touch. And then this last one is the settling frame. Let's take all of these, F9, go to easy ease. Now this one needs to go uh, faster slow, like the others did, because it's gonna get a massive impact. This is actually the opposite movement of the pink's movement at this point, yeah? The pink movement at this point is going slow to fast, ramping up. But because it's the point of impact is roughly one frame before, as we've seen here, woof, that's when we want the movement to be really fast on this. So fast to slow, yeah? Boom. Nice. Boom. Now, usually on the rest of these, we've left them, but I'm going to add just a little bit of tweaking to this. So I'm just going to take these and push them just a little bit, at least on these first two. The last two they will, will leave practically normal. But those two, I think, benefit from just a little bit of Boom. snapping. Boom. Nice. And that little extra bounce at the end there just adds a little element to it. And we can use that little extra bounce to move our mouse over and start deleting our shapes because we are finished with that first bit of the animation. Boom. Boom, boom, boom. That adds a bit of niceness to it. Bam, yeah. Bam. That looks really nice. So let's take this last 10 frames of this null object, which we can collapse everything now. Okay. And let's just open up the keyframes of our cursor by pressing U. And let's open up the mouse ones as well. So we've got our cursor taking 20 frames to move over here. Let's have it rest there until what is basically the last shape, and then we'll have it start to move again. We'll keyframe the position, move 10 frames, and have it move directly to the center of our pink block, or the visual center of the pink block, something like that. Hold for five frames, one, two, three, four, five. Keyframe again, move 10 frames, and move down just to the right, or rather let's do it to the left of this yellow block, hold for five frames, keyframe, move 10 frames, come down to the right hand side of this green block, hold for five frames, keyframe, move 10 frames to the center of the ball, hold for five frames, keyframe, move 10 frames, which pushes us past the duration of our composition. So I'll just quickly give us a bit more bit of time there, another second. Yeah. And then we can stretch out all these layers that need stretching out. I was in a good flow there and that ruined it. <laughs> uh, let's grab all them and all them as well. That should give us enough time. Hold for five frames there, move over 10 frames, and then I'm just going to copy our first keyframe so that we get a perfect loop of that mouse movement. Then I can hit N and trim that composition down to its perfectness. Now, the only thing I'd say about this is this looks fine. Yeah, we've got the movement. It's going down, it's quite, it looks like a mouse movement, but I, I prefer adding a bit of arcing to this. So you can see where we've had influence on this last frame here, we've got a little bit of overshoot. So at the moment our mouse does this little weird bloop like that. Okay, now you can fix that by just clicking on your path and dragging this handle back to the center. Then it's gonna stop that from moving. Okay, in that, in that brief pause where we do want it to actually pause. Now we're going to do the same thing we did before, which is to select our points here with our pen tool, which is going to give us a handle and we can start working in some nice arcing movement because I don't go straight point to point. I usually do like a little arc when I'm clicking things. I'll be like, oh, I want to delete and then I'll move over to here and you'll see that my hand naturally has a bit of an arc to it. So we'll just do that with all of these. Maybe we have them come in different directions each time to add a nice uh, line of movement through the 
animation. And as you can see, if you're just adjusting one handle, you still get a nice sharp point on all the others. Uh, maybe this one should go up. So again, you get that nice sharp point. And we'll try and keep them as natural as possible. And then this one, oops, that is the wrong part there. So we'll just add it to this one instead. Like so. Um, is that always going to affect this way? I think it might, unless we go to converting it to a Bezier curved keyframe. Yeah, it's always going to affect that one. Yeah, let's not do that. Let's leave that last one straight then. I think that works fine because it's resetting. So we have all of our movements of our mouse now looking pretty crazy. You can see as it's building them, it's nice straight lines. And then as it's deleting them, it adds some curves in. Nice, that looks pretty good. Now, the deleting thing is nice and simple. <laughs> um, you take the keyframe where it finishes. And at some point in this five point block, I like to go just two block, two keyframes in, uh, two frames in rather. You take all of your layers, which are visible. Uh, first of all, we should trim this pink layer just to be consistent. Um, we should trim it like we did all the others. You take your keyframe and a couple of frames past it. You just cap those layers. Delete. Moves over. A couple of frames past it. We grab our yellow layers, alt square bracket, deletes. Two frames past it, alt close square bracket, deletes. A couple of frames past it, alt close square bracket, deletes. And there you have it. There is our nearly finished animation. That looks pretty good to me. Boom. Oh, that looks nice. There's one last thing to do, which you probably noticed already. When that pink shape gets deleted, there's one thing that should also get deleted along with it. And that is the shadow that it's casting on the yellow box. This shadow here. So all you need to do is just take your yellow shadow layer and cut that off at the same time. Delete. Yeah. And I like the fact that it's still kind of just jiggling as it gets to be deleted, which is quite nice. So as this box gets deleted, we'd need our green shadow to get deleted along with it. And then these don't cast any shadows or they do, but you can't see them because it's on the flat, which is not visible in this particular animation. OK, last thing I did then was I took a frame that was roughly finished and I went to composition settings and I turned it into a square. Which looked nice. Then I added a adjustment layer on top, control alt Y. In that adjustment layer, I added some noise. Because people really like the grainy kind of effect at the moment. So I added, I think, about 4% noise. You can see it just adds a little bit of graininess to it. Maybe you could push that up to about 7%. And I made it monochromatic so it doesn't use color noise. And then I added some turbulent displace to roughen the edges of uh, the animation. Now, obviously, that's quite a large turbulent displace, probably not the effect you were going for. What I did was I cranked the size down to as small as it goes, which makes it these nice rough bubbly edges. I put the amount, I think, at about 35. In fact, I can just check. Uh, about 30 there. So I put the amount down to about 30. And I put the complexity way up, which makes a nice roughen edge around everything. OK, and then that is your finished animation. Boop, 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 boop. Last thing to do was export that as an animated GIF. So I opened up Media Encoder. I grabbed my composition and chose File, uh, Export, Add to Adobe Media Encoder Queue. And what that does is it takes your composition with all of your relative settings and it crushes it for you. Um, crushes it for you? It doesn't do that yet. It adds it for you to the Adobe Media Encoder queue, which should pop up any second. 
It's a bit finickety sometimes. If it doesn't do that, uh, ooh, which I think it just did, yep. If it doesn't do that, you can just drag and drop this onto there as well, if you want to. I then took the uh, encoding settings here, which are usually on sort of MP4 or MOV, and I changed them to an animated GIF, which you can do under the format, animated GIF options. 768 by 768 is fine. Frame rate is fine, like so. Just hit OK and hit Render. That's going to go through then, and this way you'll get a nice looping GIF that you can upload to Facebook or whatever you like. Uh, if it's Instagram, it has to be a video. They don't, they don't like animated GIFs on Instagram. Um, once that's finished encoding, look at your animation in all of its glory. And as you can see, perfectly looping. So that's it for today's tutorial. I really hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed making this one. Uh, let me know if you want more little things like this, and hopefully I'll see you next time on another episode of Tip Top for some more motion graphics. Remember to subscribe for more tips, tricks, and tutorials. Thanks for watching.